Hey guys, I'm Dave Klein. Today I'm going to talk about everything we know so far about Bloodborne post TGS and the alpha build. Bear in mind, as the game isn't out, many of these things are subject to change. Also, I'm going to be breaking the game down into various sections, with links in the description, so if there's something in particular you want to hear or don't want to hear, you can just skip over it. From interviews with Hidetaka Miyazaki, the creator of Dark Souls and Demon Souls, it sounds like Bloodborne was always a joint venture between Sony Computer Entertainment, or SCE, and From Software. SCE approached From Software around the time development on Artorias of the Abyss DLC was settling down, and according to Miyazaki, it was still before the initial PS4 announcement, but the idea of working on new hardware was very appealing to us, so we eagerly agreed. As a note, the Artorias of the Abyss DLC released to the States on October 23, 2012, which would mean that the initial development on Bloodborne began around two years ago. While comparisons have been made to both of the Souls games, Miyazaki says those of us actually working on the game never even considered making it Demon's Souls 2. Even looking at it objectively, it does seem like a very SCE-like decision. He does however say that the format of the game is very close to Demon's Souls, it's in the action RPG genre, and it features a behind-the-back camera. From there, however, the setting, story, various gameplay elements, etc. will go in their own direction for this game. If Miyazaki-san is to be trusted, which, let's face it, he isn't, any and all connections to the previous Souls games, lore-wise, are probably just inside joke callbacks. Bloodborne controls and feels incredibly similar to the Souls games with a few key differences. The first and most noticeable difference is that the player no longer uses a shield. Miyazaki tells us, in Demon's Souls, the battle system was really defined by swords and shields, particularly shields, and it ended up feeling a bit passive. With Demon's Souls, we had the more passive feeling in mind when creating the battle system, but with this game, we want to make it more active, make it more of something where you're fighting your way out of a dangerous situation. Given the lack of shields, a number of big changes have been implemented. The player now wields a weapon with two different functions. What the secondary function is relies heavily on the weapon, and with the alpha build, we got to see a few different examples of this. Switching between weapon modes can actually act like an attack, and extend out your player's combo while simultaneously switching your weapon mode. Another major change is that instead of a shield, the player now wields a secondary weapon, which so far seems to be different gun variations. Miyazaki tells us, when I thought about how we could express this idea of more active battles in the game, I thought that guns could be effective. However, I didn't want to turn the game into a shooter. I wanted the guns to show their true usefulness in close quarters combat. That's why an era in which guns existed, but they are still more like old timing guns really worked for this game. The guns themselves utilize limited ammo, and aren't actually very powerful. They act as a deterrent and way to stun your enemies, but more importantly, are the new way to parry your enemy in Bloodborne. By shooting your gun at an enemy in the middle of their attack, you can stun them, giving you the opportunity to perform a critical attack. This works on both smaller and bigger enemies, and it seems as long as you can time it out properly, and are willing to take the risk of getting hit, most enemies will be able to be parried in this manner. Also, as your gun uses bullets, which you have a limited number of, that means you actually have to pay attention to how often you shoot your gun, and how often you use critical attacks. The critical attack itself seems to use the player's hands, so it's unclear if your weapon actually affects the power of this attack. Backstabs seem more difficult to pull off this time around, as a normal attack won't backstab an enemy. Instead, you must stun them first from behind, and then you can pull off a backstab. As the game is more aggressive, and there are no shields, a new health restoration system has been implemented. The way this works is, if you're injured by an enemy, you'll lose a large portion of your health, indicated by a white line on your health bar. However, for a limited portion of time, immediately after being injured, you'll be able to regain some of your health back. The amount you can gain back is indicated by the red extending past the white line. To gain your health back, you need to be aggressive and attack enemies. Their blood will act as a health restoration and slowly refill your health gauge. Also, it seems you can use dead enemies to the same effect. But again, you need to do it during the limited amount of time. There have been a lot of concerns over this mechanic, and if it'll make the game too easy, or be too easily exploited. From my personal experience in the alpha, I found that, if anything, the mechanic will tempt you to play sloppy, and actually cause you more harm than good. The amount of time the health regain is available is a fairly small window, and you'll be tempted to immediately start playing incredibly aggressive, which isn't always the best idea. 
while it's not clear at the moment, so far it seems Bloodborne has limited health recovery items, so I actually really enjoy the health recovery mechanic. It rewards you if you play well, and punishes you if you play sloppy. So in the end, it actually ends up feeling very fair, and in my testing, didn't feel exploitable. Once again, you're able to dodge away from enemies using the circle button, but this time there's a slight variation. When you're not targeting an enemy, you'll roll normally and can roll in any direction. However, once locked onto an enemy, you can only dodge forwards, backwards, left, or right, similar to Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls. Also, while targeting, instead of rolling, you'll dash in the direction you're heading. While it's unclear if this affects iframes, and I'm not sure if your recovery time is any quicker, it's definitely possible this will be an important mechanic. Torches are once again back in Bloodborne, and this time seem to act as they were intended in Dark Souls 2. During the alpha, there was a dark room where you could hardly see anything without whipping out your torch. This similar functionality and lighting was available in both the Dark Souls 2 E3 and beta builds before being taken out. However, given Bloodborne is running on PS4, I imagine this mechanic is here to stay. And finally, something I believe everybody will appreciate, Ragdoll Physics are back as well. Bear in mind as this was an alpha test, it's possible certain aspects of the controls will be customizable, but for the time being, this is how they were set. The controls themselves are almost identical to the Souls franchise, except for when it comes to using the weapon's alternate mode. This time around, Triangle is designated to your Blood Vials, a quick consumable healing item similar to Grass and Demon Souls. X is for interacting with the environment, Square for using items in your inventory, and Circle is for dodging. The control pad switches out your various items and or weapons equipped on the fly. By tapping the touchpad to the left, you can access your gesture menu, and tapping it to the right will access your online menu. This time around, the shoulder buttons are designated to all your weapon attacks, including switching your weapon mode. R1 is your light attack with your primary weapon, and R2 the strong attack. Meanwhile, L1 is your weapon adjustment and will switch between weapon modes. L2 depends on which weapon you have out, and will either act as a way to shoot your gun, or as an additional attack for your primary weapon. With certain weapons, by holding R2 or L2, you can charge up the weapon for a more powerful attack. Once again, by tapping forward in R2, you can perform a lunge attack. Meanwhile, in testing, I personally couldn't find any way to perform a kick or a stun attack, so for the time being, it's unclear if there still will be stun attacks, and if so, what controls they're designated to. When it comes to rolling and jumping, for the time being, the controls are the same as they were in Dark Souls 1. If you're running and tap circle, you'll jump instead of dodging. Tapping the right analog stick doesn't seem to do anything this time around, and it's unclear if this will be customizable. While climbing ladders, the controls are similar to Dark Souls 2. If you hold up in circle, you'll be able to quickly climb a ladder. Meanwhile, holding down in circle allows you to quickly slide down the ladder. Tapping R1 on the ladder allows you to attack overhead with your fist, while tapping R2 on the ladder allows you to kick downwards at an enemy below you. Also, if you're at the top of a ladder, you can tap R1 to attack over the top of it, allowing for even more variety. However, if you run out of stamina on the ladder, you'll fall off. So, oh god, no! Forward, you can attack whatever's at the top now. And finally, plunging attacks are still available. And I have to thank Peeves for actually testing it out. Ow. There were four primary weapons available in the Alpha, and two secondary weapons available. The primary weapons consisted of the Saw Cleaver, which is what most of the game has been marketed around, the Hunter's Axe, the Kirk Hammer, and the Warped Twin Blades. The Saw Cleaver has both a powerful short-range mode and a weaker long-range mode. In either mode, by holding R2 you could charge a powerful attack, adding an extra element to the weapon. It was fairly quick and fairly powerful, acting as a good intermediate between the other weapons. The Warped Twin Blades have a quick, fury-striking, dual-wielding mode, and a slower, clunkier, one-handed mode. In one-handed mode, you could also charge your Twin Blade using R2. However, this was unavailable when dual-wielding, which focused on speed. As you no longer have your gun equipped while dual-wielding, the weapon has an extra function available. By tapping L2 in this mode, you would quickly jump backwards while attacking your enemy with the blades, thus acting as a good defensive measure. The Kirkhammer doubles with the classic sword. Instead of the weapon having two distinct styles, you can either attack with the swifter and less powerful sword, or break out the massive, slow, and powerful hammer. Like the other weapons, you can combo by switching your weapons in the middle of attacking, so I imagine a huge strength of this weapon will be by utilizing this technique. And finally, the Hunter's Axe acts similar to the Saw Cleaver. 
like the saw cleaver, its second mode allows you to extend it out for more range. However, by doing this, it turns into a two-handed weapon, restricting access to your gun. The secondary weapons available were the blunderbuss and the pistol. The blunderbuss acted as you would imagine a shotgun would. It had a powerful spread shot which could stun enemies close by, but was short range and thus ineffective at long distances. Meanwhile, the pistol didn't have the same power, nor ability to stun enemies like the blunderbuss, however, was much better at shooting enemies from longer distances. Both the blunderbuss and pistol worked in the same way when it came to parrying and performing critical attacks. The blood vial is the most important item we know of, as it acts as our form of healing. In fact, the blood vial is so important, it has its own inventory slot and pressing triangle within the alpha was designated solely to using these. The blood vials are similar to the various grasses in Demon Souls. They instantaneously heal you for a set amount of health and they're limited. You can find them off of enemies, corpses on the ground, and presumably other places. Like Demon Souls, if you die and you've used up all your blood vials, you'll just be out of blood vials, so you'll need to manage them carefully. Another healing item is the foul-smelling pill. The foul-smelling pill cycles with the other normal inventory items that you tap square to use, and this one slowly regenerates your health over time, acting similar to the life gems of Dark Souls 2, or Elizabeth Mushrooms. Molotov cocktails can be found which act similar to firebombs and are your new explosive throwing item. Simply equip it and tap square to toss it. The Molotov cocktails can be used in conjunction with oil urns. By tossing an oil urn at an enemy, you'll coat them in oil, allowing you to do more damage by tossing a Molotov cocktail at them. Finally, we're given a pebble for distracting enemies in large groups and allowing the player to tackle them one on one. But of course, these are just the items we know of so far from the alpha. By accessing your online menu, you're given the tools you need for multiplayer. Using the lolling bell, you'll summon players into your world for help. Meanwhile, the small resonant bell will summon you into another player's world. The parting shot allows you to either leave a co-op session, or, if you're the host, dismiss others from your co-op session. And finally, the notebook allows you to write messages to other players. This time around, players are no longer ghosts in multiplayer, but real players. You'll either hunt down other players or help each other out, and an integral part of multiplayer will be in hunting beast players. Beast players being other players who have used too much tainted blood, and thus transformed into a beast. So far, unlike the Soul series, the bosses are first found without a fog gate. You'll enter into their area, and after they appear, a fog gate will materialize behind you. After your first encounter with a boss, the fog gate will then appear before the boss fight. So far, outside of the trailers, the only boss accessible in the alpha was the Cleric Beast, a giant werewolf monster somewhat resembling Manus from Dark Souls 1. There was one more hidden boss players were able to find by going outside of the bounds of the alpha, but I'll talk about that boss later for those who don't want to be spoiled. The one thing I want to point out is, the fog gate rule still seemed to apply. The Cleric Beast itself was an incredibly powerful, quick and aggressive boss, even given its size. By shooting your gun at the Cleric Beast's head a number of times, depending on your gun and range, you could then stun it and perform a critical attack. The critical attack then became inaccessible until after the Cleric Beast performed a sort of recovery on its face, allowing you to perform the strike again. From watching the trailer, it seems like more bosses will resemble the Cleric Beast, so get ready for more giant malformed werewolf boss fights. Another enemy that could be found in the alpha, which looks like it could be a boss, is a giant Cthulhu-like spider that can be seen in the distance clinging to a building. It's very likely this will be a boss, or at least some sort of mini-boss, similar to in Dark Souls 1 when you can see the Hydra at a distance. According to Sony Japan Studios' Masaki Yamagiwa, Bloodborne takes place in an ancient, forgotten city called Yarnim, known for an old medical remedy. Over the years, many hopeless and afflicted people have made long pilgrimages to Yarnum in search of help. As the main character, you are one of these travelers. However, you find that Yarnum is also cursed with a horrible endemic illness. You must navigate the perilous streets of the city, fighting off nightmarish creatures, malformed beasts, and deranged mobs stricken with this horrific illness. The Alpha of Bloodborne takes place in the city of Yarnum, and we see these very mobs Yamagiwa-san was referring to. We see the mutated beasts being burnt at the stake by these mobs, and the mobs want your character to leave, and even form hunting parties to try and get rid of the various beasts, as well as yourself. As illness and disease is a factor of the game, notice that all the clothing sets we've seen so far in the player character include some sort of mask to cover your nose and mouth. It's likely that this is the reason why. 
Also, we've seen a plague mask as well, indicating just how heavy the theme of disease is to the game. Blood is integral to the game and story, and as implied by Yamagiwa-san, there's some reason and motivation for your character to travel to Yarnum, likely because he himself is infected and looking for a cure. As your character is infected, it seems the answer to temporarily curing yourself is in blood. However, there are two different blood types, tainted blood and pure blood. Tainted blood is much easier to find and can be found off of general enemies. However, consuming too much will transform your character into a beast. This beast is harder to control, and other hunters will now target and hunt you down. Meanwhile, pure blood can reverse the effects of being transformed into a beast and has no known negative effects, but is much harder to obtain, as so far as we know, it can only be found off of other human players and certain NPCs. For this section, I'll be talking about various elements that players found by going out of bounds in the alpha. I'll only talk briefly about it as I don't want this video to be taken down, but there are some very interesting finds worth talking about. The final day of the alpha test was delayed as players discovered this hidden section. On the final day of the alpha, by jumping onto a bench and then over the side of one of the fences, you would clip through the ground. However, prior to the final day, you could actually land on the other side which I'm hoping is still an available shortcut in the vanilla game when it comes out. Regardless, at the end of this segment, players were able to find an additional boss. This boss is another hunter you meet earlier in the alpha who actually helps you take out some smaller beasts. When losing enough health, he transforms into a giant beast to take you out, and probably looks a lot like what you as a player will be able to transform into with enough tainted blood. If he kills you, he'll eventually save this line. Players of Demon Souls will instantly recognize Umbasa as being particular to that game and the lore of Demon Souls. So, is Bloodborne and Demon Souls connected? Well, given what Miyazaki told us about development in the story, those of us actually working on the game never even considered making a Demon Souls 2. I think it's more likely thrown in as a wink to the players. In my opinion, it's likely similar to the Moonlight Sword being in just about every From Software game, from Kingsfield to Armored Core and then the Soul series, or similar to patches appearing in both Demon's Souls and Dark Souls. A fun wink and a nudge to fans of From Software. The following information are simply rumors from a possible leak. It's information I wanted to share, but please do take it with a grain of salt. In online multiplayer, you may become a boss later in the game if you collect enough blood to strengthen your heart. This could be what the co-op beast hunts I was referring to earlier are. There will be covenants once again, and in some covenants, the sickness is so strong that players can choose to consume their own heart, permanently binding them to that covenant, and transforming you into a beast. You'll then become a regular mini-beast boss enemy within the world, similar to a red phantom. Once again, these are just rumors, but I'll provide a link to the source in the description of this video. Bloodborne is set to release on February 5th, 2015 in Japan, and February 6th, 2015 in both North America and Europe. Pre-orders are already available, and by pre-ordering from certain retailers, you'll receive an exclusive messenger skin. Alright guys, that wraps up everything we know so far about Bloodborne, as of the Bloodborne Alpha. If you want more in-depth details on the gameplay mechanics, I highly recommend watching Peeve Peverson's video, as he explored a large multitude of mechanics with a live chat asking various questions about how things worked. And stay tuned to my channel over the coming months, as I intend to continue talking about and covering the game in various ways. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace. But it wasn't until 1998 that this franchise would take the big leap into the realm of 3D with The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. This game was a critically acclaimed masterpiece, earning 10s across the board from most review outlets and the prestigious 40 out of 40 from Famitsu Magazine, the first time this had ever happened since the magazine's inception in 1986. 